All set? Just sign. Awesome. Uh, well, thank you everybody for coming this morning. Uh, we're really excited to be here, and, and thanks for taking your time to listen to our session. So uh, we're going to be talking today a little bit about finding the right Drupal partner through your RFP process. Um, and just to uh, introduce ourselves, um, my name is John Stewart. Uh, I head up ZenSource, uh, our product development, uh, business development, and really working with our agency and development partners to develop web apps. And I'm joined by Jake Bell, who's our chief architect, who's going to talk a little bit more about some of the some of the technical details about what goes into things, but uh, Jake leads up our uh, cloud architecture and oversees the engineering for our experience platforms and code base. So, a little bit about us: um, we are an open source platform combining uh, Drupal hosting, Drupal support, and an experience design system. And really, what we are geared to do is partner with our agencies and help clients provide a foundation, Drupal foundation infrastructure uh, and accelerate their web development. Uh, we're based on the East Coast, uh, three offices up and down the East Coast of the US and uh, to work across a lot of different uh, verticals, healthcare, education, financial, manufacturing, et cetera. Those are our, those are our big ones. So what we're gonna talk about today um, is really a, a, a few different things. So this is really geared toward um, both the, the client side as well as the, the partner platform side. So from uh, the client side, kind of understanding if you're developing an RFP for a new Drupal partner, whether it be development, whether it be a Drupal platform, hosting, support, et cetera, uh, or if you're the site builder and, and fielding those RFP responses, you know, what are the types of things you wanna look out for? What are the types of things we're seeing and seeing success with when going through that pitch process and, and getting selected to work with a different uh, you know, client partner? So um, just kind of starting with the summary of truths about Drupal and what, you know, what, are, what are the clients asking us? What are they asking us to solve? Um, why are they coming to Drupal? So you know, starting with community or culture and industry, um, why we love Drupal. It's flexible. Um, it's grown to an enterprise level in terms of its security. We're able to get the market faster and we're minimizing financial risk with the tools that are available uh, in terms of our time, in terms of our budget, in terms of the things the community uh, provides. Um, you know, from a community perspective, you know, leveraging the community to develop features, but also having it be easier to upgrade and support, um, and cost, seamless third-party integrations, making sure it's future-proof. Uh, from an experience perspective, uh, having the admin experience be marketing and content author persona first, um, you know, sourcing what we can from the community, things like layout builder, um, you know, various authoring tools, but also building our own features to streamline things for our client authors. And you know, Drupal's constantly evolving from a marketing perspective, the API capabilities, cross-channel marketing, and being able to push content out. These are the things that our clients are asking for, whether they're already on Drupal or they're already committed to Drupal, or if they're considering it, this is what we're really hearing, what we're seeing going to the RFPs. And you know, just kind of looking at who our, who our personas are, who our clients are, um, you know, what, are, what are we hearing? What are they telling us? They're saying that you know, their current CMS is limiting. It's not flexible. It's more expensive to make updates. There's too much code that goes into making updates. Um, you know, the CMO side is probably saying, you know, I'm looking at not just a website, not just a web app, but you know, an experience platform. How are we driving conversions? How are we uh, you know, in, in the education space getting more uh, admission fulfillment forms? In the, uh, in the healthcare space, how are we getting more requests and appointments, things like that. Um, and from our CTO side, we're hearing the needs of, you know, their current CMS is probably end of life. We're hearing more and more that, you know, why are we going to Drupal? Because it can live anywhere. We can develop it anywhere, we can support it anywhere, we can host it anywhere. Um, and we're hearing from our IT partners that, you know, they like that freedom and flexibility to not be tied to one vendor, but in many cases have a smaller team and wanna know that they've got a partner that can support it. You know, one thing that's really interesting that um, we're seeing more and more uh, over the past couple of years in particular, I feel like every single client comes to us, or every single prospect comes to us and says, I don't want to replatform ever again. I don't want to redesign ever again. I want to do this one time and I want to con continuously evolve. I want to continue to, um, you know, build on top of our tech strategy, build on top of the foundation. I don't want to come back in five or seven years and have to replatform again or do a really costly upgrade. Um, you know, going from seven to nine or seven to eight or nine uh, is a pretty big leap. And beyond that, um, I want to know that those upgrades are going to be pretty painless. Um, you know, at ZenSource, one of our big 
big features is that we maintain all of our clients for their security updates, but also we do all of their upgrades, incremental and the major releases so that they're always on the latest version. Um, but that's, you know, in, I think in terms of the RFP process and understanding how you can deliver um, a web app um, and experience platform for your clients where they don't have to worry about a replatform or a major expensive upgrade in the near term and can really focus on growing their tech roadmap, doing the things beyond phase one to really evolve that ecosystem. Um, that's what really after, and that's what we're hearing the most from our from our clients. And you know, from the authoring perspective, um, often we're hearing that that old system is just not flexible. It takes too long to do things. Our brand's getting lost because maybe we have too much flexibility. Um, so in terms of when we get these RFPs and we get these um, these proposals to, to go and pitch our clients, whether you're coming from a development shop or a platform for hosting and support and, and you know, more like ourselves, um, what is success going to look like? You know, from the client perspective, we want to make sure that we're delivering on time and on budget, but avoiding those hidden platform costs and those ongoing development costs, being able to maintain that. Um, you know, delivering a, tr a platform that is true to that strategy. Uh, one thing we often talk about is that Drupal should be a platform that really enables your digital strategy. It shouldn't be limiting that digital strategy. It should be helping guide and enable. So creating a platform that allows them to stay true to that strategy, but also really evolve it over time, that's what success will look like. And all while making sure that that code base is flexible, the authoring experience is low code, it's easier to maintain with less developer support, um, and that ease of authoring, making sure that the onboarding and the retention with the inter internal audiences uh, that's probably paramount to anything, making sure that the authors can maintain this thing and retain um, the knowledge within the tools that we build. And we're going to talk a little bit more about this in a moment, but making sure that that content migration is smooth um, and the ease of that scale for additional content. Um, the content migration part of the process is always the most time consuming, it's always um, the most expensive and it's always the most stressful because there's just so much that goes into it and really factoring in the time, uh, the budget, and making sure the partner has a really good idea of how to migrate that content and migrate it effectively is gonna pay for itself tenfold down the road. So, you know, where do we start? Um, you know, finding the right platform and partner that shares your vision of that brand enablement and that strategy. Um, so through that RFP process, finding the right development partner, but also finding the right platform for hosting, for support, you know, for additional features, design system, whatever it might be, um, that's what we want to figure out in the RFP process is to guide and vet those different vendors to make sure you're finding the right partner that's going to meet all of your needs. So um, different things, different approaches to look out for, things that we're uh, always working with our clients as we develop RFPs to make sure we're vetting, but also things that, you know, from the platform side, we really want to make sure that we convey and, and build trust in our clients and in our, in our prospects is around how we approach the admin experience. So, um, you know, in that process, really inquiring into the vendor's process for developing the admin requirements, but also deep diving into that admin design process. So we all know we're all here because we love Drupal. It's highly customizable. There's a ton available in the community, but it's also, um, you know, something that we can really partner with our, uh, our clients, our authors, our Drupal development partners, and um, really be collaborative in terms of the workflow and the different authoring tools that we build. So um, one thing we always encourage our clients to do, and from our side, always offer to our clients to show um, our demos of our work. So, um, you know, we've, whether we're building a site from scratch or we're, we're taking over a site or maintaining it, um, not all Drupal sites, Drupal 8, Drupal 9 sites are created equal, even though they're using a lot of the same modules, maybe the same distribution, uh, whatever it be, might be, uh, the results can be very, very different in terms of the implementation, in terms of the approach. So um, I think it's really important to work with any potential partners to figure out, you know, what, how do they approach the admin experience design and what does it look like and is it going to work for us? Um, because again, uh, what we've seen is some are incredibly easy and intuitive and you know all the fields are in the right place and labeled great and in you know really great use of layout manager and a variety of other tools to help um, remove friction from the admin but other sites on the exact same platform exact same uh, set of modules we've seen just things that are completely different than that so it's really important to really pressure test that and you know one way we've been successful doing that we call it a product playbook um, 
maybe you call it uh, requirements. Uh, we also call it a build a reference guide from time to time. Um, but really defining the business and function requirements, but also putting a lot of time into the platform and custom experience needs. This is a process that we always encourage uh, our clients to do, and we account for a, a quite a bit of scope up front in the discovery phase to make sure that we're doing this together. So um, what does that mean exactly? We do stakeholder interviews at the outset of a project. So you know, from the ZenSource side, we'll partner with our agency on the development, uh, development side and figure out with our clients you know, what are the needs of the business. Um, we're going to create prioritized business requirements and function requirements. We're going to do a tech roadmap of what it looks like now versus three or five years down the road. We're going to collaborate with marketing and IT to identify all the integrations, make sure we're thinking about what this needs to do now, how it needs to scale in the future. But I think even more importantly, what we really want to do are identify opportunities. How do we uncover pain points, um, you know, features that are error prone, um, things in the current system, whether it's an older iteration in Drupal or another platform, what's not flexible, what's not working. And we want to identify the quick wins, but also the longer term enhancements that are going to save us time and make the authoring experience that much better. And then what we really do is we understand the needs of the authors. So diving into their workflows, um, I don't just mean Drupal permission and workflow and, and roles and things like that, but I mean like their day to day workflow. Um, you know, what else do they have on their plate? What does their day look like? How much time do they spend in the CMS? Are they a small centralized team that develops all their content? Um, are they a bigger decentralized team that has more authors in there doing just very specific things, whether it's just updating like news or events or something like that, um, but really trying to figure out what their different touch points are, how many you know, cycles of reviews do they have, um, who needs to approve certain things. Um, working with an a, a, a education client right now where they have a core team that does the content writing, but then they have five or six different layers of review and approval. Um, before it gets published out. So identifying what that end-to-end -end journey looks like and building the tools that are gonna streamline that, make it easy, incredibly important. Um, and then you know, looking at those friction points and figuring out how we can remove them as we do a new implementation. So uh, you know, how we tend to approach that and how we you know, encourage our clients to collaborate with us and, and with our agency partners is to onboard and bring authors up to speed early. So. Um, you know, we encourage uh, one on one training of the latest Drupal admin in the code base that's going to be used. So, you know, something we'll often do with clients too is, you know, maybe we are a year away from a site redesign, but there's an opportunity to get some new marketing landing pages in market now. Um, try some new creative, getting used to the Drupal 9 interface, getting used to our code base. It gives us a lot of, uh, a lot of opportunity early on to figure out what works, what doesn't work. What can we optimize for the bigger redesign? Um, and it gets authors familiar with the tools before we get into our detailed training. Um, and then we build out these requirements together. So it's the functional requirements, but those CMS experience requirements, um, we sit down with our clients and we go through layout by layout, module by module, how is this gonna work? You know, what's there by default? What are the name, what are the field labels? Um, you know, what's on the page when we create a new one? How easily can we clone things? All those different types of pieces and then diving into their permissions model, uh, how are they gonna maintain site governance, all those things we do with our clients. So um, kind of getting back to the, you know, how that ties back in terms of the proposal piece, I think making sure that, um, you know, as the partner we're guiding our clients and recommending this approach to really make them feel comfortable with the tools we're building. But then, you know, from the client side, making sure that we're, we're asking our, our potential partners about this and we're, um, you know, we're factoring the time and the budget and the resources to really deep dive into this throughout that design process uh, is really key. Content migration process. So um, as I mentioned a few moments ago, and I'm, I'm sure a, a lot of us uh, ha have been through this more than a few times, but you know, uh, the content migration process is super time intensive and super resource intensive. Um, but when done right, it's, you know, it's the difference between launching on time and on budget and not. And, um, you know, we believe that it should be a mix of automated effort and manual effort. So, you know, I think if a vendor says, you know, we can do 100% um, manual migration, uh, they're probably not investing the time in the tools for things like using the Drupal Migrate API. There are plenty of things that we should be able to script and migrate over and not rely on authors to do. 
But at the same time, any vendor that says it's got to be 100% automated probably will have reasons down the road why it can't or why there's issues. Um, so, you know, from our perspective, finding the right mix of what needs to be manually migrated and what we can automate to have the integrity of that content be the best that it can be um, is the right way to go. That's usually what we recommend to clients in the RFP process uh, it, when we talk through that in the pitches. Um, but we also, you know, coming from the client side, uh, really recommend that. Um, really pressure testing that with your potential partner and really deep diving into how they're going to handle migration uh, is, is probably one of the most important things for success. Um, so, uh, you know, how do we do that? So I think ensuring that you know, your development partner is thinking about efficiency of automation, but being realistic about the road ahead. And, you know, we really encourage clients to dig into the approach of content strategy. How do they go about it? Um, you know, analyze how they execute the automated migration, but also their process to clean it up. Um, you know, training and implementation uh, is huge. So we have, you know, whether it be uh, a web app, an enterprise level health system, whatever it is, um, if you were to ask us for what does a training program look like, give us, you know, the hour by hour over a week or two week training, how do you approach it? That should be something that the vendor can provide and walk through uh, pretty easily. That should all be um, really canned and really, really determined up front. But you know, how we approach it is we do a mix of uh, working with our agencies on the content strategy side as well as the, the trainer side. So um, this picture here on the right is actually a picture of one of our uh, clients, uh, Cornell University College of Agriculture and Life Science. A few years back, we did a, a redesign for them and with our agency partner, Primacy. And this process you're seeing on the screen is before we even got to training. It was printing out these huge comps and cutting out modules and uh, the Primacy content strategy team you know, went through and worked with them to figure out how to develop content, how to map content, how to put together the modules before we even got into training. And then once we got into training, the Zen Source team came in and we helped them uh, go through the curriculum but using that real content, not just standing in front of uh, a room of people going through a deck of how to edit in Drupal, but really rolling up our sleeves, working sessions side by side, um, building out real pages together. We find that that is the recipe for success and um, you know, ensuring that that's part of the process, that's part of the flow, and uh, allocating the time and the people to do that uh, is really gonna help. Um, so, you know, kind of in short, you know, whether the vendor has a dedicated uh, team helping you populate all your pages, or strategists that are gonna help organize, or both, um, having some level of that in there is just gonna make that migration uh, go that much smoother and just the integrity of the build. Jake, I will hand it over to you to talk a little bit about the next piece. So these uh, next sections are covering uh, just some of the issues we run into with the uh, large sites or basically non-standard sites where there's a lot more uh, going into them than um, uh, just the average sites. Uh, so a lot of times, yeah, you run into this with, um, you know, hospitals, continuing care, uh, education, social, where they've got a lot of either data coming in from multiple different systems, they have uh, multiple departments that might want their own permissions, their own ecosystem within the uh, content management system. Um, or just even like multilingual things where the normal approaches don't always uh, translate very well. Um, so there's definitely, I mean, again, a lot of modules out there, but um, it's a good to know whether the vendors already vetted these are going to work with that um, particular approach. And uh, also, if in the case where, say, custom development is needed, if they're familiar enough with um, whatever the API available for the set of modules they're using to actually, um, you know, bring that to fruition. Um, so, yeah, as it says here, um, you want to make sure that uh, the whatever solution they're offering is uh, tested to scale up to the enterprise level, but also without necessarily locking you into any proprietary um, functionality. So. Uh, down here, uh, we can discuss some of the things that uh, you know, we just run into. John touched on some of these briefly, but um, 
you know, just making sure that they uh, are up on their compliance, especially if any uh, there's going to be any uh, personal information or PII stored on the website. Um, you want to make sure that uh, they're developing these uh, solutions to scale. Uh, and what that uh, what I mean there is both in the form of uh, upgrade paths, but also making sure that uh, the solutions that are working for once you've populated 10 pages are also working if you're publishing, say, 500 pages. Um, you want to make sure that uh, whatever solution they're doing is uh, flexible enough and that it's designed to integrate well with a lot of the other community modules available. Um, sometimes we run into where a solution might work fine in certain cases, but then when you start adding workflow revisions on top of it, things start to uh, get a little tricky. And then uh, what we'll touch on more in a second is uh, importing and managing any, say, external data. And that kind of goes back to the content migration piece of the external data. So, um, you know, while the content migration of the actual site content, the page content, is, is so time intensive and in consuming. Also really vetting that, you know, where the client's data is coming from. Uh, is it coming from a proprietary database? Are there things that we're designing that don't live in that data and needs to be commingled in Drupal? How do we marry that data together and have it all display and work perfectly on the site? Both the third party and a Drupal specific. Um, we just had a case with a client where they have data coming from a third party feed, but also want to be able to create the exact same looking content in Drupal, but it's just more, um, you know, more personalized, kind of more in the flow of their tone and voice. But being able to, um, you know, really vetting a vendor to make sure that they have the approaches to bring in data and display it and how to work from a lot of different places, um, we find next to the overall content migration is probably one of the more uh, more time consuming parts and one of the gotchas that you really want to make sure your uh, your chosen partner really has a really good way to vet that and, and uh, execute. And uh, just to get into some specific questions that um, uh, we like to ask or that we see asked common, um, again, the, in the uh, process of data, uh, are they familiar with things like migrate API or feeds? Uh, this goes beyond even just uh, migrating data from the existing website, but uh, most large sites that we work with, such as healthcare providers, they'll have, um, uh, say, like provider data coming in from their credentialing system and need to run on a schedule and that needs to continue well past the initial uh, site development, uh, usually daily. Um, the other big one as far as scalability is what sort of uh, caching system that uh, they've worked with. If they've used, if uh, their solutions tend to offer memcache, redis. Um, obviously if you're going with like one of the, um, the more like well-known hosting providers like an Acquia or Pantheon, those tend to be documented well, but if you're going with uh, uh, you know, more of a custom uh, provider, just make sure that they've uh, worked these into their uh, solutions. And specifically, uh, when we're talking about things like Varnish, uh, if they don't go with um, uh, Varnish or one of the other like well-known ones, make sure that their uh, caching solution is supporting uh, what's called tag-based expiration. Um, and what that means is uh, a lot of solutions will, uh, when a content author is updating a page, It'll be smart enough to uh, expire that one URL, but without the cache, uh, or sorry, without the tag-based caching, uh, they don't have the ability to expire anywhere where that page is used. Um, so you start running into issues where if your site is embedding uh, articles used on other parts of the site into it, those will be out of date from the main article. Um, and that's what uh, tag-based caching gets you around. And then another uh, big one with larger sites are just any um, SEL implications. Uh, so, you know, I'm sure everyone's throwing uh, the meta tag module on as just default, but there's also uh, a, um, a big uh, push to start getting uh, data schema or JSON LD uh, functionality added on top of that. Um, it's great if whatever vendor you're going with has already come up with a lot of default values so that the content author doesn't necessarily have to fill out specific fields, but it can say, you know, populate based on uh, summary of the body text or title, um, or maybe like a hero image, uh, um, depending on if you're using like say Twitter uh, tags. Uh, and then another big one is uh, when it comes to redirects, uh, do they 
ha have they implemented a large scale way to say import those redirects and then also handle them in a uh, performant manner, uh, which usually we try to move it as far up the stack as possible. Uh, the, the redirect module is very good for doing um, like vanity URLs or uh, small amounts of redirects, but PH, doing it directly in PHP is going to be more performant than that, and then doing it in Apache is more performant still because the redirects are uh, happening now before they even uh, reach your Drupal site. Um, and so the, um, uh, the other uh, big piece is specifically with the hosting aspects of it. Um, so uh, one thing is to find out what, uh, what they're actually offering as far as uh, the services that they're going with to uh, white label. Um, so a lot of places uh, use AWS these days or Azure. Uh, preferably they'd be on some sort of cloud-based solution, uh, but if they're, even if they're not, you know, just make sure that they have the staff on, uh, on site and what their turnaround times are for um, uh, troubleshooting issues. Uh, same thing with their uh, model of security. Uh, do they have any guaranteed uh, uptime response times? Do they have their own automated monitoring tools uh, uh, at hand to show site uptime? And uh, in some cases, you know, can they make these available to you? Um, and uh, and explore uh, the other piece too would be you know, more on the security aspect is how are they keeping the data safe? Um, do they have encryption at rest? encryption and transit? Uh, do they have um, good auditing as far as who has access to your data? Um, certainly for the ones that are white labeling, say AWS, um, AWS has certain guarantees up to a point, but it still is onto the vendors implementing these to have their own layers of security on top of that. Um, and then, yeah, as I mentioned above, uh, uh, see what kind of encryption they have available, if it's just at rest or if it's um, in transit as well, or maybe something on top of that, say, with um, uh, web form encryptions. So the uh, other big piece is uh, the support aspect of it. Uh, so the site can be perfectly up to date when it launches, but then, uh, you know, quickly, you know, within a week or two, we'll start uh, falling out of compliance depending on uh, if there's security updates available. Uh, so see if your vendor offers like some sort of uh, support package to keep everything uh, up to date. And if they do offer that package, uh, you what, how far do they go in uh, covering that? And so if, uh, do they run updates and then if there's issues that's then put on your team to solve? Um, or are they actively monitoring a lot of the core modules that um, they're using in their sites uh, to see like, you know, when new updates are coming out or any uh, known issues. Uh, you really like find out they're capable of uh, diving into like solve problems or if that's just not necessarily covered. And also if uh, upgrades are offered, how far those go, if they're uh, just minor versions, say to like 9.3 to 9.4, or will they actually cover larger version updates as well? Uh, yeah, I, I don't think you'll find any ones that um, cover, say, 7 to 8, but uh, for sites that are already built on 8, the upgrade process tend to be smoother, and so that's not as unrealistic. Um, so they, uh, yeah, as I said here, um, because it is so critical, make sure to factor that into um, whatever budget that uh, you have for the project. Um, we'll talk more about this in a second, but um, as far as one-click updates, they're, uh, they're very good for what they are, but don't necessarily assume that every aspect of the site is going to be covered by it. And if they're, they do have a lot of automated testing, what's their process for actually releasing these updates? Uh, is there like human element to reviewing these updates to make sure that um, the site isn't in an error state after they're done applying them? or um, uh, you know, if, is that on your team to basically review the updates before they're pushed out? Um, so some specific questions you can ask as far as hosting. Uh, if they're not using, you know, one of the mainstream environments, uh, they should be able to provide uh, audits like SOC 2 and uh, get you any sort of information on uh, like an architecture diagram to see uh, uh, where the firewalls are in place, uh, how access is obtained. 
um, you know, how, they, how you're expected to get, say, uh, SSH access or uh, FTP access to uh, work with the file system. And if they do offer firewall, what, um, what types of uh, things are they checking for? Does that cover uh, uh, DDoS protection, things of that nature? Uh, so in the case of like support packages, um, the one-click updates, again, they work very well for small websites, but when you start getting into larger scale websites, what we tend to find is that um, a lot of them don't necessarily support Composer very well, or if they do cover updates, they only cover core, and only then if uh, there's no patches being used on the website. So just get into the specifics of what is and what is isn't covered, uh, just so you're not surprised uh, post-launch. Um, and then uh, if the vendor is offering any sort of proprietary based tools that uh, sit on top of Drupal, uh, just find out exactly um, uh, kind of what Dreis was mentioning in his um, keynote earlier is who owns the data at that point. Um, some of those tools like are very, very smooth for the editing experience, but then when the, if you stop paying for your subscription, you're essentially locked out of updating the site after that. And so it's, uh, it really needs to be like a pro-con analysis of whether they're smooth enough to justify potentially um, losing some level of ownership to the data. And take this last part. Cool. So you know, just in close before we you know, take uh, any, any questions you might have, you know, uh, from the client perspective, you know, really understanding your partner from a development side, from a platform, Drupal platform side, you know, what's the special sauce that they bring to the table? And for those of us on the site builder and platform side, what is it that we offer? What can we bring? What sets us apart in the pitch process, in that whole RFP process, and when we're you know, competing against other agencies and platforms? And you know, what makes you truly special? You know, if you're a development partner on the Drupal side, Drupal platform, uh, you know, you're gonna take advantage of the community for the client's benefit, but devote resources to making that unique experience. Um, if you're considering Drupal or have already committed to it, it's likely because you expect certain things to come standard, but are also excited about the flexibility that we have that we don't always get with enterprise. Um, and you know, make sure your partner is prepared to not only leverage Drupal to accelerate the build, but also bring tools and strategies to really build out that technical roadmap. Um, you, you know, for us at ZenSource, we saw years ago that you know more and more clients were moving to Drupal every day. Again, Dreis spoke about this at length this morning, but um, you know across healthcare, across education, across these more enterprise huge ecosystems, more and more clients were seeing or asking for it every single day. And um, you know ZenSource decided at one point let's look at building a front end and back end experience design system, something that we can install, and it has all the foundational. UI modules and page layouts and forms and site search and whether it's a really small build or a really large build, using the client's budget and their time and their resources to do what's really custom and unique to their brand is what it's about. And that's and that for us is kind of you know having those foundational UX accelerators is, is what we think you know makes us special and what we tell our clients um, as well. And you know for those of you looking for different vendors um, on the client side are also. You know, those of you who are site builders and, and, and work for a particular platform or software company, trying to you know, really unearth the value prop and what's unique to your brand and, and what's going to set you apart from other, other uh, potential competitors, um, that's what we really want to convey and, and try to find um, harmony with our clients. So um, you can visit us at zensource.cloud uh, for more information or to learn more about our products, our, our, our hosting, our core support, um, our experience platforms. Um, and you, know, you can reach out to Jake and I anytime. Um, we'd love to chat, we'd love to meet, um, talk about your business, talk about what challenges you have or what uh, solutions you offer. Um, we love to partner, we love to collaborate. Um, so please, please feel to contact, please uh, feel free to contact us anytime. Um, any questions we can answer? Anything? Uh, Hello. Um, hello. Not sure. I need a mic. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, I'm Laurent from Total Energies. Uh, so, as clients, uh, I have an itchy question for you. Is um, sometimes we're in situation where our vendor 
under de deliver and we realize the penalties uh, will not solve the issue. Uh, and I would like to have your feedback from your perspective. Did you meet like unfair penalties uh, in, um, in, um, during a project or do you have some suggestions how to, uh, for us to write better penalties? <laughs> That is win-win, you know? Yeah, so, so there's a question more around, so it sounds like in your case, the site was built and implemented, but was it more of struggles with like internal IT in maintaining the site? Or is it more that the requirements maybe weren't? Uh, it's like uh, the way the contract is written, and you know the, so if uh, basically in case of, um, um, usually the penalties are uh, uh, delays, like uh, the delivery is late or the quality, that, that too many uh, uh, critical bugs. So in these in this cases, uh, the next bill will be lower by this percentage. So, but uh, when we write an RFP, um, this is the point where we, we can fix that or improve this, this part. So it's we don't meet this or we meet this, but in a fair way. Yeah, no, yeah, uh, great question. A couple different ways we've looked at it. So um, what we often encourage clients to do with the RFP process is to write in a warranty period. Um, you know, really having a, a certain set amount of time, developer hours, developer, um, you know, a, a certain criteria, whether it's 30, 60 days after go live, where, mm -hmm. um, you know, they have to fix anything that's deemed critical. Um, writing in assumptions like anything that's you know, uh, deemed critical, you know, priority one, functional display, um, uh, and then also what we all we often do is work to build in assumptions that you know in order to meet scope all the requirements in the business requirements the build reference guide whatever whatever you call it the product playbook have to be met so before we can consider it a true handoff having the assumptions in place in that RFP process of you know final sign off on requirements and you know the work is not done until these requirements are done all you know tickets issues bugs etc um, you know must be complete um, and then and then from that perspective writing in that warranty period of how long they have to fix those bugs and what success looks like we find that's the best way to do it because if we don't get to the bottom of those assumptions when the site goes live what does success look like like to your point maybe there's uh, you know things that you think are critical that the partner doesn't think are critical or, or, or vice versa so um, making sure that there's that ample time beyond go live and uh, a certain expectation of delivery and time of delivery the more assumptions up front, the better. The more clear we are with the scope and what's in and what's out and not leaving it to be um, you know, vague in terms of what those requirements are, that's, that's always what seems to work best for us. And it's best, it's best for our client and it's best for the vendor to be really tr clear and transparent. But that, that's where we've been. I would say too, it's good to uh, work in assumptions on um, uh, adding in like various review checkpoints during the project. Uh, so versus say having like the finalized solution delivered all at once, um, you know, preferably like the vendor can start getting you into the system, maybe necessarily before the entire site's finished, but just early enough that you can still see yeah. the content structure and maybe some key elements of it to catch mm -hmm. these sort of issues early in yeah. the build process, which makes it a lot cheaper to you know, uh, pivot at that point if there's just more of a, not so much that they're not meeting the requirements, but maybe there's just a misunderstanding of exactly you know, what the requirement was. You can catch that kind of stuff in it. You know, much yeah. earlier in the process. Yeah, that's, that's actually a really important one. We often will work to put in certain you know, deliverable milestones in the RFP, um, and that's a great one. Like what we like to do is release uh, you know, a homepage, three layouts, and 10 modules first. And if that's good, we move on. If it's not, what are, what's the feedback? Then in the next release, okay, we make those improvements, make those revisions, release the next batch. The product's better, it's more tailor-made to the client requirements, and you're not getting this huge delivery that you're stuck with at the end that's too late to fix or out of time, out of money. So those iterative releases uh, to, you know, to staging before we go live, we find the clients are always a lot happier with the product when we do it that way, and we're a little bit more uh, iterative and transparent. Mm, I see. And uh, maybe I have an advice for the, for the audience is like, it's always easier to make a contract with the, uh, w w when it's fixed price, uh, better determine the, the means, like with allocated means. You, 
rather than always focus on the result, like you, because the result is always, as you said, assumptions by for of what the size of the team, the experts uh, at that that's at that time, and that can create a lot of issues after if you say, oh, I'm not happy with the result, uh, but uh, it was based on assumptions from the from the course. And if it's fixed bid and there's an assumption that those things need to be met within that fixed bid scope versus mm -hmm. it took us a lot longer than we thought and you know, if there's gonna be another $50,000 change order for this feature because we underestimated it. Mm -hmm. um, another thing we do that really helps is try to do statements of work for discovery through user experience and then estimate the build after. Um, it, the uh, more opportunity you have to go through that strategy, go through the requirements, go through user experience concepts and then have a range for the build and have those really focused requirements and wireframes to develop the build budget, mm -hmm. that always ends up being a lot easier as well because it's so much more accurate at that point versus trying to make assumptions up front that you might not know. Thank you. Thank you. Um, if we were in the ideal world, um, which uh, documentation would you expect from the customer side to uh, start a website re uh, revamp? Or how customer can better prepare to that process? Uh, number one will always be uh, thorough, documented, third-party integration uh, documentation, uh, APIs, proprietary databases, uh, that data. Um, whenever we have more documentation around um, any data or uh, homegrown proprietary APIs that you might have, um, that's always gonna be the best because when we get into doing an integration and we know there's some database over here and there's some random XML feed and we'll create a job and import it, um, when it's more ambiguous, that's where we, we eat budget the fastest and the more documentation and production ready um, you know, APIs we have up front uh, is definitely gonna be the best way to do it. Jake, would you agree or is Yeah, no, I'd say like, um, uh, like the second, probably after that one, the second most important is, uh, uh, this would probably be shortly after the RFP process, but um, if it's possible to give your vendor um, access to say like maybe a staging environment that you have so they can actually log into the system to see how the data is structured, see how the mod, you know, what modules are being used, things that you might not necessarily think of in a vacuum, but they'll be looking for based on um, you know, the type of project that they're doing. Hi, um, I've come across this issue a couple of times recently, and um, so a client approaches us and says, well, they'd like to have a, a, a project done, relaunch or whatever. And um, one of my first questions is, well, can you also send me some of your internal document, I mean, documentation of your workflows? Um, how do you author content? How do you do things? Um, they don't have it. Uh, how do you deal with this type of situation where there's very little documentation that the client could provide to you so you understand their workflows? Yeah, that, that goes back to what, what we call the product playbook, where as part of our discovery, the stakeholder interviews, we meet with the authors um, because that's that's one piece that you know, more times than not is not documented. Um, uh, there's not time, there's not resources to do that, but um, what we do is we'll sit down with the authoring team. Usually it's the core marketing team and as we develop the functional requirements, the CMS experience requirements, we'll work through the current workflow. What are the authors doing? The review, the review process, how are they publishing, all those different pieces. So. That's where we'll factor in time and budget up front to understand and document what the current process is. Because you're right, it more times than not is, is not there, but we need to understand that. So we have a couple more questions. Um, what tools to use by agency for workshops and scoping the project with the customer? What are the most expected formats of artifacts for selection process as the answer to the RFP? Uh, can you say the first part of it again? What tools to use by agency for workshops and sco scoping the project with the customer? Maybe they're thinking more like some of the UX tools, like freehand. Or yeah. So um, you know, one of the projects, one of, yeah, things we use a lot are um, things like um, um, like Miro. Um, you know, we'll often do uh, workshops with our clients up front um, using something like Miro or something like you know a free freehand where we'll do interactive workshops together to 
you know, sketch out, you know, what's in their ecosystem, uh, start doing some, you know, low fidelity wireframing, that kind of a thing. Um, that's, th th that's what we find, especially with all of us being remote these days, more of like that interactive whiteboard. Uh, Miro is a product we have a lot of success with, um, and we use that quite often to help, to help scope and kind of help understand requirements before we get into the build. Um, that, 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 in my opinion, is probably the best one. The other one is what to look for in vendor or RFP when our policy requires that site to be hosted internally? Um, yeah, that's a, that's a really great question. We run into that all the time. Um, I think that goes back to, and Jake, I'll, I'll defer to you on this one a little bit, but I think that's where it's really important for your development partner to have expertise in their own security team. Do they have their own information security officer that's going to um, help work with your IT team to make sure things are within compliance? that we're doing best practice for data encryption and how we store and pass data. Um, I think having, even if you're not hosting, if your development partner isn't hosting, but having hosting capabilities and understanding the configuration, how to troubleshoot different server configurations, um, that's really important because when there's you know, on-prem systems, uh, you know, if IT is supporting, I think the more that we can uh, do to help support them, you know, Jake probably having like, um, a shared repo that we all have access to, that kind of a thing. Um, I don't know if you have any other thoughts yeah, on that. Yeah, um, yeah, the, the shared repo is definitely um, a big one. A lot of like issues we have, um, we've run into in the past is where a vendor has their copy of the source code, the client might have theirs, and the process is manual to sync those up. You really want to be working in a centralized one if you can. Um, but also, uh, as far as uh, hosting internally goes too, I'd, I'd want to spell out where where the vendor's support ends and yours begins. Um, like, so does the vendor just troubleshoot site code? Will they troubleshoot uh, actual uh, environmental uh, issues that might come up on your server? Uh, will you be maintaining the like server updates, security updates, or will the vendor, uh, and or frankly, are you able to give the level of access if you do want them to support it to have access to those servers to um, to do it themselves, or is it uh, assumed that you have staff on hand that can handle um, deployments and uh, the update process and work with the vendor to uh, get those updates out there? Uh, I think we have one more question. So it's more for GenSource. Mm -hmm. Is it possible to migrate from GenSource to own hosting at some point and oh, yeah. use it without the subscription? Yeah, 100%. That's actually, you know, that's our, our business model by design. So GenSource, we have uh, our own distribution uh, design system, but it's all entirely built on Drupal, uh, built on open source. Um, we have subscriptions for hosting and for uh, our support and our upgrades. Um, we do have certain standalone host experience things for things like landing pages, but uh, a lot of our clients host externally and support externally, whether it be on-prem, Acquia, Pantheon, whatever it is. Um, at our core, it's a code base. The whole idea is that we don't have anything that you can't walk away from, but um, there are certain things that are value add, like the support and like the hosting um, that's more subscription based, but everything is um, you know, totally, uh, you own it and, and can move with it. So uh, what we do with a lot of our agency partners is they, um, you know, download our design system and our code base and they have full control to go and use that to build any implementation they want for any client and host it anywhere. So that's really where, where we are at our core, but happy to give anybody a demo or, or talk through it more, uh, you know, next week or whenever. But and we're, we're in the process of um, getting the distribution actually posted to Drupal.org. Mm -hmm. um, uh, just haven't uh, gotten there yet, but uh, um, hopefully by the end of the year we plan on um, mm -hmm. getting everything cleaned up enough to... Uh, Yep. get posted to the community. All right. I think we're out of time, but thank you, everybody. Thank you, guys. Thank you.